Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? You're listening to Riff Worship, the podcast that attempts to answer the age-old question, what makes a riff? Why do we worship all things the riff by taking a look at some of our favorite riffs of all time? I'm one of your hosts, Austin Paulson. With me, as always, is the great Baldini, the great bald hope, Arkansas's prodigal son, Dylan Adams. How are you, Dylan? Good, bud. Not as sore as I was last week. That's right. I'm doing a lot better. Rub some dirt on it. R- rub some dirt on it. We we are yeah we're back with another excellent episode. This time we are rejoined by our very good friend Justin Swindle uh, to discuss an album that I know we have connected over, uh, connected on over uh, several times. But first of all, how are you, Swindle? I'm doing great. Uh, wow. Somehow, even though I'm by far the oldest, I'm not the one in the most pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's a I feel like I could just like quote any crowbar song and everybody would laugh. You know, <laughs> life is pain, birth is pain, there's a ringworm track. Existence is punishment. <laughs> there you go. You get to sleep you get to sleep laying down tonight, right, Dylan? Uh last night was the first night in a week, maybe eight days, that I actually slept on my back. Wow. Wow. I've been I've been sitting <laughs> sleeping sitting up. It's been like Dylan's a horse. Uh, <laughs> in more ways than you can imagine. <laughs> Shut the uh, fuck up. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> um, but it was like, I, I've been having to sleep sitting up. So, like, I've woke up many a night recently, just like chin and chest, mouth open, <laughs> drooling on myself. I stopped taking the pain meds on Sunday just because I, I couldn't handle the um, all of the side effects from them. Ba- <laughs> backed up like a dam. Man, it's been misery. I I look like I look like the guy in Dreamcatcher that had one of the worms in him. <laughs> like I man, it's so bad. You're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh the worm the worm episode's in the, the next episode. Uh, <laughs> but it for the time being, uh we're gonna be discussing an album uh that has just celebrated an anniversary 40 years ago. Uh, back in May on the 25th, 1983, uh, it was a it was a big year for nerds everywhere. Dungeons and Dragons was in, uh, and heavy metal definitely took note of that. I am, of course, talking about uh, the debut Dio record, Holy Diver. Uh, I guess again, I want to start out this episode by asking both of you, how'd you find this record? Uh, why is it significant to you and your listening habits? Uh, if you still listen to it now, uh, yeah. What What are your origins with Dio's Holy Diver? Swindle, I'll let you take this one. Mine's a little less uh, deep. <laughs> I don't know how deep mine is, but uh, when I was a uh, when I was a kid, uh, my my dad had this album on cassette. Uh, back back when uh, vehicles only had cassette players in them. Uh, <laughs> so I, I have a distinct memory of it for when I was like five or six, five, six, seven. Uh, and then it kind of, I never got it. I never uh, bought it when I was a teenager. So kind of after I was a small child, I didn't kind of didn't keep up with the album, but yeah, it was there when I was tiny. Did anything in particular stick out to you as far as like uh, song wise? Uh, did it make you uh, feel a certain way? Do you remember anything about like hearing it for the first time? I still remember Don't Talk to Strangers. That was like, uh, and then when I when I saw the song title Straight Through the Heart, I was like, oh, I remember Straight Through the Heart too. Like I remember <laughs> those two songs very well. Going back and re-listening to it, you know, did you did anything surprise you in the in going back and listening to it again for our conversation? Did you know other than 
you know, maybe the differences between the 83 mix and the 2022 mix, um, you know, anything that like really stood out going back and re-listening to it? Uh, that, well, the 2022 mix sounds really good. Uh, the bass especially is very clear on that 2022 mix. Uh, we t- I've talked about it right before we started recording, but the mastering on like the OG version, just so bad. The hits are <laughs> like uh, Holy Diver and Rainbow in the Dark are so much louder than all the rest of the songs. Like, I don't I don't know if that's supposed. I feel like when people master albums, they want all the songs to be a right similar volume mm-hmm. consistent. I don't know if they mastered those two songs different at a different time, but it's wild. You know what? They could have very well have done that because this was during the period where like every record of some sort had to have a single. So, I mean, they yeah. could have mixed those two differently. So they were a little bit for a little bit more in the forefront when it came to sound quality. Um, I'll actually have to go back and listen to the original mix. It's been a long time since I've heard that original mix. So now I, now that you've pointed that out, I got to, I got to touch on it. Um, I think my introduction to the record was, uh, I was a little bit older. I was around 16. Um, I believe at the end of 05 or maybe, maybe 06 is when Tenacious D's, uh, the pick of destiny came out. And obviously the opening track to that, uh, has, a cameo from Meatloaf as a young uh, JB's father and uh, his, the door closes if you've ever seen the movie and there's this great poster of Dio sitting on a throne and it just (laughs) kicks in with this great vocal take. And I went, okay, this is rad. Um, I need to hear more of this. So like, I think I downloaded, uh, I downloaded Rainbow in the Dark off of Kazaa or LimeWire at that point. Um, (laughs) And then I found Holy Diver. Um, and then around that period of time, like is when the Guitar Hero games were introduced to me. They'd probably been out at that point for a little bit. Maybe that was the first year. I don't remember. But I know Holy Diver was one of the tracks on one of the games. And my friend, uh, shout out to Norm, uh, Norm, and I would get together on like Fridays and Saturday nights and just play it. And that was always one we really enjoyed. So I picked up the record not terribly long from uh, after that for my Hastings music uh, for, I believe, like six ninety nine. You could get some really cool stuff on sale from time to time. Um, and I remember really enjoying the record. But I think around that same period is when like Black Sabbath came into my life. So it was like, OK, that's got to that's got to take a step back for a little while. So that that was my intro to this record. I've heard that Dio has lo- rocked for a real long time. Oh. <laughs> when that movie came out, man, I I have annoyed so many people on long car rides, <laughs> uh, singing literally every song. And it's kind of funny because I really don't like musicals, but mm-hmm. I mean, so <laughs> much. Of, al- everyone's allowed to have one. So many, so many uh, albums in general are just really like show tunes like oh yeah welcome alice cooper's like welcome to my nightmare just show Bad tunes. Out of hell <laughs> i listen to that stuff all the time but uh my partner will ask like and you you hate musicals i'm like yeah loathe them don't <laughs> don't like them so lauren and i've had that very same conversation she goes you know every single song on your birthday you made the whole group of people listen to it the South Park movie. You know oh. every lyric, every bit. I go, yeah, it's not a musical. Yeah, we were there. <laughs> <laughs> that or My Little Nicky. record player. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a similar beginning with this record in that I, this was right up my alley at the time. I had two records that kind of got me into heavier music that I didn't really recognize as metal at the time. Uh, I had both Judas Priest, British Steel, and Iron Maiden, Somewhere in Time. I don't know why those were the two that I got, but they were. And I listened. I just wore those CDs out. And so the more traditional uh, influence in heavy metal was really all I was about. And thankfully, a lot of these, some of these songs, the singles from this record, uh, were being played on the radio. 
And I can remember my dad yep. making fun of me so much, like rainbow in the dark. What is like, what was he even talking about? Which I still really don't understand, like what he's even referring to. It but doesn't, it doesn't matter. I love it. It's yeah. great. It's, um, it's, it's great. That, that's that's one of my favorite songs on the whole record. Then, you know, of course, there's the the music videos. I, I was a big, uh, I was very uh, propelled to like looking up old interviews and it, like mm-hmm. uh, music videos, whatever I can find uh, that was accessible to me on YouTube or just, you know, like old uh, photos and whatnot. So, you know, the lore uh, surrounding Dio and, and his whole backstory, as well as his time spent in this band was like, I was obsessed. Um, and I guess I kind of want to start by saying that the uh, the trajectory of his career leading up yeah. into this moment is is pretty wild. You know, uh, obviously he we just watched the documentary recently, yeah. which I highly recommend. Anybody should uh, definitely go watch that. I think it's on Showtime. But you know, kind of starting out in very kind of classic like fifties doo wop kind of rock and roll groups, then eventually shifting gears to Elf. Uh, kind of more like a blues rock band, yep. which I want to also mention that I own that record. I have never, the, it's the self-titled. I have never seen that on anything but picture disc. I don't know why any record store I've ever been to is the only thing I can find. And I remember Swindle, I remember I switched, so that was like one of the, the my earliest memories of Swindle is like uh, him telling me what his opinions on uh, picture discs were. And he was like, this is garbage. Why do you have this? This is, this doesn't sound good. Why would anyone want to buy this? I'm like, this is the only thing I've ever found this on. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. that's. <laughs> I mean, you're right. Picture just don't sound great. Then uh, I think Elf uh, had some opportunities given to them to open for Deep Purple, uh, which kind of uh. led to his uh, joining in rainbow as the lead singer of that band richie blackmore's rainbow they did a couple records there that were fantastic and then eventually finding himself in uh, black sabbath which you should if you haven't heard the mob rules or heaven and hell you got to do it man i mean even even check out dehumanizer it's not as good as those first two but it's it's a fun listen um and he completely reinvigorated that band that band hadn't really uh you know, shots fired here, but like the last two Sabbath records aren't good. Um, we can sit here and make jokes about rock and roll doctor all day long. You you could smell me saying oh, that. I, in my oh, life. I got it. I already knew. <laughs> oh, we can uh, smell you already. I mean, oh, what was oh. it? Uh, what were the last technical ecstasy and never say die? Yeah. Uh, those records couple, just weren't weren't great. Couple tracks, um, but yeah, nothing uh, and nothing to write home about. This band, I mean, Black Sabbath was considered dead essentially yeah. at that point they had lost their vocalist they had lost their their face and then Ronnie James Dio gets brought into the mix and arguably changes Sabbath style entirely they they went from you know this more traditional kind of blues hard rock proto metal band to a straightforward like 80s metal band almost mm-hmm. they wrote in the vein of what fit for um Dio's kind of vocal phrases and how he did it Uh, And it even got to the point where Ozzy sang a lot with the riff, whereas Dio actually sang lines, right? Mm -hmm. Like he he actually had phrases uh, and stanzas and and the whole nine. Um, But those two Dio records or those two Sabbath Dio records that came out at that point almost, almost led the career trajectory of what the first Dio record would have sounded like. Because those three records have a, these three records have a very similar sound. Uh, Songcraft, the whole nine, um, yeah. which is just a great avenue for his voice because let's face it, that's the focal point on those records. Absolutely. Yeah. The, it's really incredible to not only get a second chance, but to have like three, almost like three yeah. separate careers uh, where you almost have to start from scratch again. Yep. And the, Uh, weight on your shoulders to kind of be that guy multiple times like oh my god richie blackmore leaves deep purple what he's gonna what's this band gonna sound like he ain't he's not david coverdale or what whatever and yeah oh no ozzy's not in the band anymore what are we gonna do who's who's this uh ronald james dio feller you know uh (laughs) the uh and then to get fired or let go or leaving 
the band. I've heard multiple iterations there, of how that. What what I found out is there were like arguments over a live record. Yeah. Uh, live Evil, I think maybe is what it was yep. called. Uh, some sort of argument. That's all I know. Um, but you're right to get to leave that, get fired, let go, put in your notice, whatever it may be, and you move forward. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to form another band. My name's known. Let's just let's go that route. And I'm taking the drummer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. Let's yeah. not forget Vinny Apiece went with them um, on that one. And Vinny yeah, Apiece is. Yeah, mm-hmm. he sure did. Uh, Vinny Apiece has been in a ton of bands. Um, Van- was he in Vanilla Fudge or was that his brother? I think that's right. It's one of them. Yeah. It's, it's one of the Apiece brothers. Uh, he was also in that. Uh, let's not forget. Uh, about the illustrious Kill Devil Hill that he was in years ago with like Rex Brown. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but nope, he left, uh, took Vinny a piece with him. Uh, also, I guess he made a phone call or sent snail mail or a letter to his buddy Jimmy Bain, who played who played bass on the D.O. records, also helped co-write most of those first few records, mm-hmm. um, who played with him in Rainbow. Um and then you got to find your guitar player, right? So here's where it gets even weirder with the connections, right? The original guitar player in Dio's band was Jakey Lee. Yes. For a very short amount of time. Crazy. Well, something happened there. Jake wasn't necessarily stoked for what he was going to have to play in the album. Jake leaves, joins Ozzy's band. Uh, and then that's where you find a young Irish kid named uh, Vivian Campbell. Future guitar player of Def Leppard. Uh, Correct. And then... The new wave of British heavy metal band he was in at the time was... Sweet Savage. Sweet Savage. Which Metallica covered, right? Uh, maybe. Perhaps. Yes, oh, they, they did? did? Okay, there you go. So yep. I know some of the riffs from that band also kind of ended up uh, being reused for some of this record as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to be sought out, or really, yeah, you're. I think the story or how it was told in the documentary was that... Uh, you know, Ronnie and the bass player basically going out to all these different clubs looking for yep. guitar players to kind of steal, not being very impressed until they wind up uh, finding this 19 year old Irish kid uh, playing kind of more of like a blues style. They wanted an English guitar player. And uh, they brought him into jam. And I think what really sold it was that he, they were kind of goofing around. He played like a Chuck very kind of riff and that was it yep. like it would kind of brought him back to those like old 50s rock and roll days but to be 19 years old and you know you are that good where you know what what was i doing at 19 years old what were any you know any of us really doing at 19 oh, years God. old <laughs> to be asked by a you know former lead singer of uh rainbow and black sabbath hey i'm forming this band uh we're gonna be putting out an album on warner you know I need a guitar player. Yeah. You're the guy. That's crazy. That's it. it, You know, can't even, you're, you're barely legally, or I don't know what the, the, the laws are overseas, but you can't even vote hardly. And you're now you're going on tour all over the world. Basically. That's the story though, isn't it? That's the old like legend, like young guy gets found, joins favorite band or Mm -hmm. plays with legends, uh, plays with heroes, whatever it may be. I mean, that was a big thing. In that period, I don't know how often it happens now. Um, yeah. But I've, during, I've seen Rockstar. I don't know what you're talking about. I was going to make, <laughs> I've got another Rockstar thing I'm going to bring up when we get a little deeper into this Wonderful. because this is, this is that period of time where it makes sense, right? Um, shout out Marky Mark. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing that really stuck out to me um, about his playing is, these songs were obviously created for a avenue for Ronnie James Dio to sing, to yeah. show his voice off, do what he does best. Um, Vivian's guitar playing adds character to the songs, adds a different texture. Uh, he's not stepping all over the vocals. The way it's crafted is like, yeah, he's got riffs, and I can go through. I mean, there's riffs all over this record. Uh, just these great blues, hard rock-based riffs, and... He doesn't step all over the vocal. He serves the song. His solos aren't stepping on anything. They're not wank fest. They actually, you know, play out and they actually have a beginning, middle, and end to them. Um, so he does a really good job. I mean, his lineage too is he also did some work with White Snake at some point, uh, some live work with Thin Lizzy, uh, Phil Lynott, 
um, like the whole nine. So he's got, you know, he's got credentials there uh, to add to this, but it just shows that there was something there that who knows what they saw in him, who knows what they didn't see in him at that point at 19 years old. Um, probably a lot of drive, um, you know, a lot of, you know, willingness to do anything at that point. Um, but he adds a lot of character to this record, a lot of character, because I think in any other guitar player's hands, maybe the songs wouldn't have sounded the same way. Maybe you had to have that blues, hard rock based guitar player, as opposed to a, you know, at this point, like a shrapnel records or like an American heavy metal style guitar player, like a, like a glam band or something. Yeah. Well, and you say he's not, I agree. Like he def, he definitely doesn't step on anybody's toes. He doesn't like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, overplay, but I will say that there really isn't like, he is, he's like a Bob Ross man. He is just painting with such yep. detail. Like he's got a little, little tree over here. A little, uh, a little wave over there, a little bird. There is so much, like you said, character to what he is actually playing. There really isn't a space that he isn't filling uh, with as a single guitar player on this record. You know, he's yep. that's it. Like he's that's the it. guy. So, I mean, there's like a little lead lick or a little slot. I mean, he's doing so many unique little details all over this record. Uh, you know, if you really pay attention. It is so much fun to just kind of, I almost wish I had like listened to like an isolated track of just the guitar, just to really see all the little things that he's doing. But it is certainly a good choice for sure. And I don't know if, you know, if there's any particular riff that he plays swindle or Dylan, uh, on the, on the record that kind of stands out to you. Um, the big, I've actually got a list of them, uh, obviously. And here's where my rock star joke kicks in the opening track, stand up and shout. Um, that opening riffs, a thrash riff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's proto thrash to me, uh, almost like um, it's not into the void, um, but there's a proto thrash uh, Sabbath song that it reminds me of. Mm. Um, but also stand up and shout. I got real upset because I was like, is it this the song from Rockstar? <laughs> is it there like a stand up and shout bum, bum, or like a bum, shout bum, or something bum, like bum. that? I, you have that. You have that soundtrack in I, your back pocket. I know yep. you do. Oh, uh, yeah. I I thought that song sounded so 80s. I was like, this riff stands with like Van Halen and like Motley Crue. Yep. Oh, like, yeah. So well, it is just like right there with those. I saw someone compare it to uh, two minutes to midnight. There's a yes. couple songs okay. that it's like it has a very similar kind of like right hand attack. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree. Swindle. It is v- very at the utmost. 80s kind of uh, metal guitar style for sure. Symptom of the universe is what oh, I was thinking yeah, of. Sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gypsy, which, you know, obviously, you know, very dated song title there. Um, but the opening riff to that, it's a great, great riff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Caught in the middle. Uh, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting track. That sounds like Journey. S- some really cool vocal lines. That riff at the beginning, the like pre verse riff. Mm-hmm. Is the one that was taken from the other band, the Sweet Savage? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the that, one. It's a very ma- the some of it is very major key sounding, so it made me think of these big, especially the hook in the song, which is the vocal line. I was like, this could be a Journey B side, yeah. Like to me, um, Strangers has a, a great riff at about a minute and ten seconds in. Um, I just, you know. Anything on here, like all these songs have a great opening riff to introduce the song, aside from maybe the two hits, which are a little bit different. Um, you know, Straight Through the Heart, opening riff, uh, Invisible. Yeah, Straight Through the Heart, uh, definitely really, really huge sounding uh, riff. Also, just to kind of uh, piggyback off of uh, Swindle's statement, yeah, they Caught in the Middle is a riff from Sweet Savage. Uh, the song that from song. Sweet Saw is called Straight Through the Heart. Through oh, the is heart. it? Yeah. And so they yeah. still, so they took uh, a riff from the song and then also the title for a completely different song, which I You love. know, it's funny that around this same time, another album came out that just celebrated a 40th anniversary that some things like that happened with as well regarding two separate thrash bands. What could oh, that yeah. be? <laughs> uh, something called The Four Horsemen and Mechanics. 
there. Uh, <laughs> very similar thing. Uh, Rainbow in the Dark. Um, everybody knows the keyboard line. Probably more so than anything in there. Mm-hmm. But it's got a great riff in it as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, is it Shine on the Night as the last track? I think that's right. That thing just stomps. It's got that kind of 12 bar blues kind of feel to it and that vibe. It just it stomps. I also really like Invisible. I know it kind of starts out kind of slow, but that's uh, a great track. That that riff is incredible. Yeah. And and some of the stuff I'd kind of forgotten about, really just re-listening to some of these uh, tracks that you really forget. I've had this album on like multiple formats. Like I had mm-hmm. this on vinyl. I have it on cassette. Uh, I think I even got like maybe a remastered version like from like over 10 years ago or something like that, perhaps. But uh, you know, you come back and like, man, that one, that one's good. I can't believe I don't, you know, instant instinctually go to that track or maybe some of these other ones I caught in the middle. But yeah, that's a that's a good riff. I love the um, the close of the album, mm. that like very last riff. Uh, yes, in Shame on the Night, it reminds me of In the Flesh by Pink Floyd. And there's mm. uh, I want you, she's so heavy by the Beatles. It reminds me of like the main riff of that song. The, let's let's talk about the singles really quick. I mean, I I more so think of you know the music videos, but yep. you know these were pretty pretty big uh, to kind of lead with as far as like all right, this is my new band. Uh, we of course have Holy Diver, the title track, uh, the lead single for the record. I think it reached number forty on the mainstream rock chart, and uh, I, I had always figured it was about you know just kind of like a medieval sort of theme not at all it's about god kind of yeah like a christ-like figure yeah yeah he's on a who's on another planet and he sacrifices himself to redeem his people i was like would have never have guessed that but god almighty (laughs) that is a that is a high on fire record in its own in its own right i mean i know he liked the read but man he has read some stuff that i just they smoked a lot of pot on this record we need that we always need to put this consideration i know i've made that I've alluded to that a couple times, but they smoked a lot of reefer on this record. Um, it's, uh, it's important, I, I guess. I mean, there's a there's a bit of info not to deviate from the single conversation about the song "Invisibles." So there's a reverse sound at the beginning of the song, uh, and that sound is someone went out of the studio, got a tire that was full of air, and they seeped some of the air out of it and just reversed it. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> Hi. Um, you're right. Okay. <laughs> go, go get fuck this it. thing. Let's put it on the record. It's, it's good. <laughs> if it's not on the record, this thing ain't selling shit. It, uh, on Nevermind, there's a song that like starts with hand fart. It's That's a- right. <laughs> yeah, I always think of the music video, and uh, which is also very... God. Crude B movie, him in, in front of that green screen where there's just like hellfire behind him. Yeah. Uh, I always thought the some of the characters look like, ah, uh, what's that damn thing's name from He Man and the Masters of the Universe? Uh, Skeletor? Skeletor? No, no, no. The, the little Beast Man. The uh, imp thing, the wizard. Oh, yeah. I know where yeah. you're going with that. Sorry. Should have looked we, it up before. I just watched Willow recently for like the first time ever. And I just listened to this album like the same day. I was like, huh, this You've is never uh, seen Willow. I'd never seen Willow. Damn. I, I and I listened to this record that same day, just going like, huh? There's, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, I, I get it. You know, if you listen to Willow in reverse, you can also hear a tire. <laughs> uh, <seeping> out. <laughs> uh, then we also have Rainbow in the Dark which I believe, you know, as far as the, obviously the keyboard part, the synth part, yep. I think was just kind of a random. You Jimmy know, Bain. It, Jimmy Bain basically yep. heads over to the synth, just kind of plays around with it and it, it fits so well. But I also want to touch that, you know, this is perhaps one of his most significant signature songs uh, yep. through, throughout his career. He almost just straight up Hated got rid it. of it. Just like, he fuck this thing, I hate it. He thought it sounded too mainstream, and yeah. he didn't want to get lumped into the L.A. bands at the time, which, yeah. listening to this track, doesn't really sound like any of those bands. Right. But I get it. I thought, uh, when I listened to this, I thought the guitar part under the synth part of the uh, 
chorus mm -hmm. sounds so much like a Zach Wild riff. And I don't know if it's like just because they're pinch harmonics. So I was like, oh, Zach Wild. But <laughs> when I listened to it, I was like, that feels like Zach Wild playing this song. Yeah, it's definitely, again, a lot of a lot of little details on this thing that are like that for sure. That yeah, I could definitely see this influencing some of his style for sure. Or, uh, but uh, what did I want to touch on? Oh, the album artwork is Murray. Also, Murray didn't even you know honestly for years. I've been a fan of this band a long yep. time. Never knew that the demon had a name. Nor, nor did I know it was called Murray. Man, you know they were sitting around the studio or somewhere getting ready for a tour, and they're like, "Yeah, the demon," and and you know someone was like, "Oh, you mean Murray?" Just as a joke, and it stuck. I found out that the demon's name was Murray because VH1 did this like top 100 greatest hard rock acts that they would just show and repeat in like the late 90s, early 2000s, and they Dio was obviously on there, and they talked about Murray in that five minute blip. And that's why that stuck with me. Murray. That's so such an 80s metal band thing to. It's like uh, Iron Maiden, Spinal Tap and Dio were just like, let's carry your let's carry around and name. Like our props. Well, I mean, who else has Vic Vic Rattlehead? Yep. Uh, I think Overkills technically has a name. The. Oh, with the bat that skull with a bat, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Murray. All right, how much weed did you say they smoked on this record? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the artwork's great. It, I mean, the documentary you and I watched, uh, they go into specifics about how that how that was so done. So funny. They it's chained it. a guy up and threw him in the ocean <laughs> and took a picture <laughs> of him. Couldn't get out. It was the. It was the the guy who actually painted the artwork, correct? Yeah. Where he was just like, I'm going to dress. Like, I was so confused watching it, watch it, like witnessing this man or like a recreation of the scene where he's wearing the 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 priest get up. Yep. He's just fucking around with chains in the ocean. Like, take the shot. Take the shot. Like, I'm <laughs> dressed. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the, the thing I the thing I love is uh, I, it made Christian people mad. Yeah. Uh, the album artwork made pe Christian people angry and the thing Ronnie James Dio said to them was like you don't know the priest could be killing the demon and yeah. in my head I'm just like the priest is chained up Ronnie what do you mean <laughs> I read that too was how like, is how? he winning <laughs> hi <laughs> oh my god it's so great um yeah, the artwork, a uh, wonderful part of this record. Uh, you know, so many lyrical themes. I, I'm still just kind of, yeah, yeah, they're big, grandiose kind of uh, singing accompanied with like the uh, some of the uh, imagery that's being painted. But I've I've never quite. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, jump on the tiger? What? Like, see? His... <laughs> I so, mean, sure. Something about a masquerade. So that that song, Holy Diver, has mm. probably some of his best like vocal like vamps of all time uh mm -hmm. none of that stuff was i know he didn't write like i'm gonna say i'm gonna make this noise at this you know at this stanza i'm gonna like scream jump three times here um but he's got some great vocal ticks in that song that just make me laugh every time i hear him um and i it became part of his thing uh big thing about this record too is like all the songs sound like arena rock songs obviously like they're meant to be played to a to they're they're playing to the people at the back of the crowd, like they're, oh, definitely. they're those types of tracks. But when he put this record out, they were playing clubs. They had to build yeah. the they had to build it up, and they eventually did. They became a stadium act or an arena act at that point. And I mean, this album debuted at fifty six, which yep. back then you could debut at fifty six and go double platinum like it did. Um, yeah, I think yeah, went double platinum uh and then what to add to your mm -hmm. arena rock thing. I I can remember my brother and I heading to our like local record store. I think I had already had Holy Diver in the last in line on vinyl, maybe Sacred mm -hmm. Heart, uh but I also remember seeing this uh album cover with 
Dio plunging a sword into the stomach of a fake dragon, and it was a live yeah. record called Intermission. I was like, I have to have this. This is incredible. Uh, the documentary definitely does a good job of kind of showing some of the uh, the stage presence of that yeah. record, which it's great. Like that's exactly what I would want to see. Who like you know the man, uh, you know knew how to draw a crowd in both on record uh, performance wise, but you know, yeah, I want to see some of the stuff you're singing about. Absolutely. Give me all of it. I mean, it's Iron Maiden's done a great job with that. No Mm -hmm. matter what tour they're doing, there's always some huge piece of equipment on stage with them. Uh, You know, Eddie's dressed up as whatever character you could imagine. Uh, And, you know, it's a bummer. We don't have Murray doing the same thing. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Uh, You know, walking out like a a bowler derby in a tie. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Give me all that. I, I, I want to like, I want to invest. If I'm watching a band like this, I want to invest as much time as I can into, I want to see what the stage is going to look like. I want to see, you know, how it's all going to entail. Give me all the camp. Give me all of it. You know, Absolutely. certain acts can get away with it. Certain can't. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of acts I like that just go out there, play the music, get it over with. Yeah. But when it comes to things like this, like, yes, bring the camp. Uh, I'm not going to see, Iron Maiden unless they have like an eight foot Eddie walking out or or anything like that. Like it would be weird to see Guar with no equipment on. Like I want all of it. I was going to say, is there a band? Can either of you think of like a band aside from like the ones we've mentioned? Guar, Iron Maiden, obviously still out there doing it after all these years. Is there a band that really kind of, I don't know if you can really recreate necessarily the uh, same atmosphere uh, that, you know, this existed in, but are there really bands, maybe Ghost, I guess, that are doing a similar kind of stage presence, I guess? You might have hit the nail on the head with Ghost being one, but even their stage presence is just more like arena kind of setup. Um, I mean, you could say maybe Exhumed uh, does okay. a pretty good job with like stage get ups and just having fun, like Horror Schlock, uh, but not to the levels of like Dio, Iron Maiden. Uh, there's not a lot of bands that do that. You know, Motorhead did it for a while. If you give me enough time, I'll puke on stage too. It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. There's not really, I mean, I don't know if there are, it's one of those things like a lightning in a bottle thing. Like, I don't know if this could really, if you're not a legacy band that has been doing it for this long, there's really these kinds of bands with such a large stage kind of arena rock presence are kind of yeah. few and far between. Um, but it is cool to, kind of revisit some of that stuff. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not really a big live record guy. I know I just said I had yeah. intermission on record, but I did used to love like opening up, um, you know, live after death or something like the double gateful with all the, you know, concert pictures and stuff. Um, actually even the Holy Diver, uh, I think the original pressing, uh, or at least the first run of this record, the, um, the sleeve had some like wonderful photos of, uh, some of the recording process and perhaps some live photos of the band from this time. Um, yeah, it is. A, it's a it's a cool record. I like this record. I don't know if I said that enough during this episode. It's uh, it's pretty neat. It's it was nice going back and kind of <laughs> re-listening to it and hearing the not only getting to hear the the more recent mix of it, which you know it's always fun to like find the new mixes and go online and immediately type in who hates this mix because <laughs> there are so many old lecherous bastards that just are like, ah, it doesn't sound like 83. Well, no, it sounds better. Like get over it. Like you have both mixes, buy them both. Yes. Um, and hearing it, hearing it, you know, how it sounds now is nice. Hearing it, how it sounded 40 years ago, I'm sure sounds good too, to an extent. Um, you know, it's they remaster records for a reason so they can put them back out. Obviously, they want to make money off of them again, but you also get to put these records out again. And if you go to like a record store or, you know, any sort of entertainment store that would sell something like this, if it's new, it's going to be on that front rack. And some kid could walk in and be like, oh, man, what is this thing on this album? What's this thing on this artwork? I'm going to pick it up. Oh, this thing's name is Murray. That's weird. <laughs> I'm going to pick my, this record up. That, yeah, that, that's what got me to be. Murray. All right, I'm sold. <laughs> that's why you came to Kentucky. 
Yeah, Murray. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Coming after this record, you know, obviously there had been a plenty of Dio records that followed mm-hmm. that I love uh, The Last in Line. I love Sacred Heart. Um, you know, there are some, you know, he continued to push on throughout the decades. And, uh, you know, maybe obviously due to trends, like some of this stuff can wane in popularity. Yep. But, uh, you know, Dio is kind of always this thing. It, Dio has been this thing that has always been there, really. And uh, what, you know, kind of we were talking about putting some much needed energy into a band again uh, back in like 2008, like the early 2000s, uh, when he rejoined Black Sabbath or Heaven Mm -hmm. and Hell. That was like such a huge moment for me personally, uh, being able to hear uh, that that lineup. Dylan and I have seen, you know, the uh, I guess. Most yeah. of the original Black Sabbath lineup performed live. Ain't no Bill Ward. Ain't no Bill Ward, though. Uh, but this band, when that band got back together, they put out that, that was a that was an amazing record to me personally. Devil like, you may know, Devil you know. Yeah, it came out in like oh eight oh nine. Yeah, and you know they went the last on thing tour. Ever did. It, it really to be that late in your career and still have like. Uh, I still got some left in the tank, you know, even for some of those Sabbath guys, like, yeah, I probably hadn't listened to, you know, a a real modern Sabbath record by that point. But when they dropped that as heaven and hell, I, you know, I was truly impressed. I think that is some of their best work, perhaps even, you know, it's a bummer. They couldn't just call that a black Sabbath album. I know there's a lot of legalities with that. Um, you know, there's certain people that probably didn't want that to happen. Um, however, Based off some of the interviews that I read in the past and seeing in that documentary, they all had a lot of fun doing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the music was good. I remember hearing, I think at that point, I heard a few of the tracks on uh, Sirius uh, when it debuted. Uh, I've never actually mm-hmm. listened to that whole record. I would listen to it. Double the Pain comes to mind, Bible Black. Um, there, yeah, there's some, there's some good riffs on there for sure. Uh, as a, you know, a later yeah. record or what have you. But, you know, I, yeah, I, this is this is one that always kind of comes back to. It's certainly one that I've, you know, if it's two in the morning and I've, yep. uh, I've got some. A uh, couple frosty ones. I definitely am turning on this for the riffs, uh, singing along to it. Uh, I guess I want to follow this up with if you could describe this record to anyone or perhaps maybe touch on its legacy you know, in 2023, 40 years later, uh, you know, what, what would you, what would you, what would you tell someone? I'd say, listen to this album uh, for the nostalgia and it's, uh, I think for an eighties rock or metal album, it's, Certainly better than a lot of stuff that came out shortly after it. Uh, I personally don't love a lot of 80s rock and metal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do like that a lot because it's not like super hair metal stuff. Uh, and it's fun to listen to. Yeah. And uh, you you don't really have to think too hard about it just put it on and uh listen or ronnie james dio sing uh i mean my take would be that it's a it's a great record to listen to just at any point you know at at any point you're like you know what i I just got to hear some like because one thing we didn't touch on is all the lyrics are positive yeah everything's a positive message on this i mean as wild as they got uh, it's a great I'm record. I'm positive to- that I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a great record to put on and like you know kind of lift yourself up a little bit. It's also a great record to to listen to if you just want to have a couple drinks and like you hang out with buddies. It's generally one I know we could all three put on and we'd be like, oh yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Um, it's also a great gateway record for anybody that wants to step foot into maybe some of the older bands because I think a lot of uh, maybe younger the younger generations of heavy music fans maybe start with what they hear first and then they might go back. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is one that would be an easy segue. It's a short record. 
The songs are well crafted. Uh, with a modern remaster, you get to hear every instrument on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of it's it's just full of hooks. It's an easy gateway record. It's a great hard rock record. Yeah, all of the arrangements are wonderful. The lyrical themes are great. You know, they're uh, some interesting poetry for sure. Lots of uh, fantastical ideas and uh, imagery being painted here. Uh, the guitar is incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the vocals are really the kind of the focal point of this record. Uh, you know, at a point where this is his like third kind of go at it and he's like 40 years old i forgot to mention like this is he had, yeah. was around 40 years old when you know this t- came out which you don't really find happening too much you don't kind of get a, a second or third chance that late in the game and then kind of make that you this is i've arrived officially like this is my thing not so much like i'm a side man or you know uh former deep purple members or sabbath or what have you uh and i would say that even to compare them to to compare Dio to some of the bands I mentioned, you know, I think this kind of leans far more into heavy metal uh, than some of those bands ever Absolutely. did. I feel like they all tried to steer clear of that label, whereas this kind of like Judas Priest in a lot of ways is like, no, like this is exactly what we're here for. This is right. exactly what we want uh, people to identify us with. So I would say it's a like like you mentioned fantastic gateway album uh if you are you know kind of a fan of uh history of like heavy metal like i am i think this is certainly a monumental record in uh the lineage of what heavy metal was and what it eventually became later on so listen to holy diver uh you won't be disappointed yeah i didn't know because i i know he was in sabbath which Tony Iommi wrote like the riffs and I don't know him and Tony and Geezer probably wrote the songs for Sabbath. Uh, I didn't know that Ronnie like wrote guitar music, but yeah. he said he specifically wrote like the riff for don't talk to strangers. Mm. And he like wrote the songs for this album. I was just blown away by that. Yeah. I thought that was cool. Yeah. I forget that he, you know, is a bass player really. And mm-hmm. when they kind of, uh, played some of that footage from the in the documentary where it's just him and Vinny like on a you know tape recorder basically playing through some of those songs together. Uh, yeah, you you forget that he is you know musically inclined. I think he was originally like a trumpet player growing up, and then found that's it bass and you know other instrumentation. But yeah, yeah, he uh, he definitely is a riffman for sure. I believe he and Jimmy Bain, the bass player, played the keyboards on the record as well oh really yep i believe they both took turns playing the keyboard in there and that's probably why the keyboards are subtle and they're also tasteful they're not just like over the top and they're not just buried in the mix either yeah i think i like heard an interview that he kind of learned to properly breathe for singing because of trumpet playing that yeah that makes a lot of sense he touched on that in the documentary too that's right yeah i mean Places you wouldn't think of. I mean, we kind of talked to Nate and Spirit of Drift about some of his, uh, you know, early uh, beginnings in music when he was in school and doing like the choir and stuff. And, you know, maybe some of that stuff carries over later in life. But yeah, I guess start learning the trumpet, Swindle. If you're ever going to front a band, you're going to have to start playing trumpet, bud. I, I know how to play trumpet for six months. <laughs> Do you play trumpet for six months? Yep. Damn. Here I played we- trumpet for a school year. You guys make me sick. I've been in bands with both of you. <laughs> I haven't seen one trumpet. How am I supposed to play drums and play trumpet at the same time? Make it work, Figure it out. <laughs> excuses, excuses. All right, listen to Holy Diver, uh, and uh, I guess perhaps get into oh. the trumpet. Oh, we, we there's one major thing we forgot about this record. In 2006, uh, metalcore band Killswitch Engage did a cover of Holy Diver, um, and that is that helped them achieve their first gold record um, based off of that cover. Uh, it also helped usher in a new wave of fans getting into Ronnie James Dio along with the Tenacious D movie. Absolutely. I can vividly remember uh, hearing this in like my high school weightlifting room 
that makes you sense. know that kill switch engage cover uh and then yeah the the movie to supplement it's around right around the same time correct yeah. same so year just same perfect. nine months whatever oh wow yeah so there you go i mean and the the video is great too that one i loved yeah. as well that, that's so, a fun video um yeah so that, that's that uh that's a good point to make you know there are definitely things kind of find a way to come back into the, you know, and then probably a few years later, then you have heaven and hell coming back again. So yep. it just, it all kind of came full circle. So yeah, listen to that cover, listen to watch all the videos, watch the documentary. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Highly, highly recommend. Uh, Holy diver, 1983, 40 years on. Uh, so we've kind of reached that point of the episode where we like to share our recommendations, gentlemen. Uh, any trumpet albums that you'd like to share with us this evening? Swindle, what are you listening to? Uh, uh, Baroness released another single, Beneath the Rose. Uh, I listened to that a few times. Uh, in your Spirit Adrift episode, Nate talked about Poison Ruin, and I didn't mm-hmm. know their new album had come out. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it came out in April on uh, Relapse Harvest. I've been listening to that and that uh snooper band super snooper I listen to their album Nashville represent yeah former members of piss bath I think god <laughs> what a what a name that's you remember up that there. yeah that's up there with um I I definitely remember the name because there's all there was also the band from Louisville called pissed on oh yeah yeah that's right like, of course of course if it's got piss in it I remember it <laughs> <laughs> what was it pissed on sold that like black flag riff off shirt with the the p uh i was something was it p colored phalluses i think so yeah i remember it was yeah you, it was dicks yeah it was you dicks were on there. so close to buying that and you Glad said to I, did. Me, I was like where are you gonna wear that yeah that's fair what are you listening to austin oh i've been listening to uh the self-titled debut record by agriculture uh which is out now on the flenser uh very much a black metal record but it has a lot of different influences as well Mm -hmm. i think there's like a folk or country song called the well on that record um there's some noise elements like at one point uh there was like a power violence band called siege that like would fuck around with a saxophone a little bit and this band whips it out sometimes as well um really been liking that can't do that can't do that please excuse me while i whip this (laughs) um I have also been listening to the new Outer Heaven record, uh, Infinite Psychic Depths. Uh, I waited. God, that uh, thing is rad. Dylan and I waited a long time for that to come out, and it definitely delivered. Uh, that's out on Relapse Records. Uh, I, as a non heavy pick, uh, I have been listening to the new Hayden Pedigo record, uh, which is more of like a just like an instrumental guitar record. It's called The Happiest Times I Ever Ignored, which is a uh, uh, reference to the uh, National Lampoon writer. I forget the guy's name, but uh, they have like a documentary on him and his story. He like also directed or wrote Caddyshack and Animal House and stuff. Right. And uh, but it's a uh, it's a really cool uh, acoustic kind of guitar driven record. Um, I'll like listen to it to kind of just, you know, drift off to sleep or if I'm like driving in the car, uh, it's like. 36 minutes long so cool record it's well, out now on mexican summer records dylan well you listen to it while you're falling asleep while you're driving the the car exactly while playing the trumpet <laughs> gotta tie it back I'm in just just hitting this horse to death uh dylan what have you been listening to sport so uh first off the monolord released a new single mm. or an ep uh called it's all the same Man, that is, I love that band. The last two releases that band has had have been perfect, both out on Relapse Records along with this EP. Uh, These two songs are, I'm assuming, or maybe a stopgap in between the last record and the next one. These two songs alone are, could have been on a new record. I don't know if they're just something they had to put out, but they're great songs. Really heavy, really lush. Um, It definitely harkens back to Maybe the vocals and the way they're produced and some of the effects on it kind of go back to the psych uh, period of rock music, but it's obviously just like doom metal. And it's just so well done. The vocals are tuneful. I mean, my girlfriend 
has heard me listening to it and has actually like perked up and asked me what that was. Um, as opposed to most of the stuff I listen to, it just sounds like a tool chest being shoved down a flight of stairs. <laughs> uh, so Monolord, it's all the same out on relapse records. Uh, let's see. There was another one in particular. You named the outer heaven record, which is great. So I've obviously got to touch on Mismore's prosaic, uh, Man, yeah. I have been waiting on that thing since I heard the last EP that he did and the Thou Split. Um, that thing is massive sounding and real bleak. Um, yeah. It's a short listen, though. I mean, it's five songs or four songs, 46 minutes. It's 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 a quick listen. I was like cleaning the house, listening to that record the day it came out. And uh-huh. I think it's the last track on the record acceptance. Holy yeah. shit, dude. Yes. You just you just find you find uh you find yourself when you're just cleaning the baseboards of your house listening to a record like that, you know? Man, I have I have cleaned my bathroom to like just bleak albums and you just sit back and you go, is it all worth it? <laughs> is it all <laughs> worth even existing? What was um, I eating? I mean, great record. It's his first it's his first album on Profound Lore as well. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And then my non-metal or heavy listening uh, this week was, so Austin and I are big King of the Hill fans. Uh, I just recently started, you know, rewatching like the first three seasons. Um, that's not to exclude that Swindle is a King of the Hill fan, but I, I feel like maybe Austin and I have obsessed over this show for almost a decade and have literally thrown Cotton Hill quotes at each other for a decade. Um, but there's an episode where Buckley's Angel comes back to see Luann. And there's a song on there that everyone knows that I was like, I'm going to listen to that album. And the song is called Life in the Northern Town. And it's by a group called the Dream Academy. So I listened to their album, their self-titled album that came out in 1985. So that that was a cool listen. Something definitely sounds like stuff you would hear on any 80s movie, but it's just fun. Excellent. Well, all great Rex. I also want to, I know we mentioned it a few times, but I just wanted to say its name. Uh, Dio Dreamers Never Die, the documentary yeah. uh, that kind of covers a lot of the information we talked about is uh, available now. You can stream it. I think we watched it on Showtime. So I mm-hmm. uh, definitely highly recommend that. Definitely touches on a lot of different things about his life, uh, his career, and uh, legacy. So you've been listening to Riff Worship for Swindle, Dylan, and myself. Uh, We'll see you next week as we talk about some of our favorite riffs, riffs, some of our favorite riffs and why we worship them.